Uh, but first, this um, very interesting survey that was done about doctors' bedside manners. And they found that chat GPT outperforms a trained medical professional in that regard. Let's talk about this with Andrew Eborn. Andrew is a barrister, broadcaster and futurist. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Nick. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. So what do you make of this study about the bedside manner of chat GPT? Well, it's something that I've been predicting for several years. The advance, the seismic advance in technology and artificial intelligence is really quite staggering. It's what Stephen Hawking called the greatest human achievement, but also potentially our biggest existential threat. And what this particular survey did, it was chat G the uh, GPT, a bit of a mouthful, yeah. uh, versus the actual GP. And what it was saying is it provides higher quality answers and more empathetic than a real doctor and this study was conducted by the university of california and what they did they compared written replies from doctors which were uh, against those generated by chat gpt and it worked out that actually what happens is 20 percent more accurate um and actually the quality uh, was not only that but also 41 percent more empathetic and the way that it was measuring this was actually the number of sentences that were given, the amount of time, the language used, and so on and so forth. So it was all terribly predictable as to what's happened. And when you're talking about waiting times to get to see your GP, uh, if you have the ability to speak to, uh, effectively, a robot, um, then you're going to be able to get that robot 24-7. You're going to get answers uh, initially and so on and so forth. So it is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's the same with the legal profession. Uh, uh, the master of the role, Sir Geoffrey Boss, uh, came out today and said, actually, uh, chat GPT could be better than several lawyers, basically providing and analysing documents and looking at cases and providing that sort of efficiency, if you like, within the system. So it's a question of people understanding the capabilities and embracing those tremendous opportunities. And, and probably chat GPT cheaper than, than a couple of lawyers as well, I suspect. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right, Nick. And I, I think this is, this is the joy of it. All these people going on strike uh, and the nurses going on strike. And I have a lot of sympathy, uh, as I say, for, for those sort of stuff. Um, but what it's going to do is going to accelerate, uh, as most of these things do, the advances in artificial intelligence and robotics. And it's happening across the board. Uh, and this is something that I've been predicting for years. We've got seismic changes in the creative industry, in the legal side, in medicine, and you're finding that AI is passing uh, exams, it's passing medical exams, it's passing bar exams uh, throughout the world. Um, and I think people need to be fully aware of what's happening. So I, I talk around the world about these things. I've just come back from Cannes, uh, where we had the TV and creative industries over there, and talking about the power of AI and how that can be embraced. Uh, but it applies to every single profession. Uh, it's been predicted that uh, 300 million, uh, basically, jobs will be replaced uh, by robots and artificial intelligence. And you're looking, it's basically, it will be contributing, uh, uh, they're saying, I think PwC, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, of these, you know, uh, by 2030, they say it's going to contribute about $15 trillion to global G uh, uh, DP. So I think we need to look at those sort of stuff, l understand what the technology is, and embrace it rather than put on our, our heads in the sand uh, as many ostriches are currently doing. Yes, uh, um, some of um, what you're saying is uh, is positive, but some of it is absolutely alarming. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the extra value, uh, the extra wealth that these things will create will just um, end up in the hands of a, a de decreasingly small number of people as uh, v vast swathes of the population are put out of business by um, by a robot. But let's just uh, let's go back, if you don't mind, to um, the, the medical issue, which is yes. where this uh, came from. I mean, I can understand why... Uh, a, uh, a artificial intelligence would be perhaps better in their bedside manner than a doctor because unlike a doctor they're not probably tired or grumpy or they weren't up all night clubbing or they're not going through a divorce and so they're always at a hundred percent of their uh, potential uh, performance but um, what about the actual treatment itself and people's reaction to being uh, treated by and getting information from a robot because we've all had the experience of being on hold to a corporation and, yeah. and you sp speak to somebody you initially you think it's a person but it actually isn't and it becomes annoying really quickly 
Oh, no, you're, and you're absolutely right. And I think the, the misapprehension is that robots no longer sound robotic. Um, and you have these sort of situations where you can replicate people's voices. So uh, retired actor James Earl Jones, for example, who played Darth Vader, uh, his voice was replicated by AI. It's indistinguishable from the real thing. Rick Astley, uh, you know, he's currently suing uh, Rick, uh, Young Gravy because his voice has been replicated. Uh, we even had Bruce Willis. He is uh, basically, it was a deep fake of the whole of Bruce Willis used for uh, his face as well as his voice. Uh, and that was licensed for Megafon, a Russian telecoms company. So what's going to happen is you can basically license your voice. Uh, so you can think that you're talking to a real person. So that gets over the robotic side. But also what happens, if you can imagine that every GP around the world had access to the best research, the latest research, and could speed up diagnosis as a result of that, uh, and basically being able to assimilate the mass, the, the tsunami of information in a really quick, efficient and speedy and accurate way, then the medical profession will just be advanced significantly on that sort of basis. So can you it's see, understanding, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but can you see actual operations being undertaken by robots without human supervision? Well, the first, well, firstly, they are currently being uh, undertaken by robots, and uh, uh, there is a, I, I've worked with a lot of the medical professionals over here from the big hospitals. But, uh, isn't it, isn't, that it that, isn't it that actual real-life doctors are using robots as instruments rather than the robots doing the work itself? Yes, and I think that so we don't scare people, so people are always worried about the rise of the machine, you're absolutely right. Is the, These AI is a fantastic tool, robotics are a fantastic tool. The recovery time by using robots with doctor supervision, that should always be the case, uh, is actually a lot, lot quicker. But it's not just let the robot get on with it, because I think that would just scare people too much. Um, the reality is, is that you use these machines, you understand the power of them, and embrace that technology to be far more efficient as a result of it. And with um, surgery uh, and diagnosis, which is one that we haven't uh, discussed, but apparently uh, yeah. AI is very good at diagnosis of uh, at Phenomenal, least yeah. some of the things that have been uh, looked at. Let me ask you a question that, we're, that uh, spans all of your uh, fields of expertise, barrister, broadcaster yeah. and futurist. If a robot diagnoses your condition and then treats you for it, what are the legal implications of that? Because who do you sue if a robot <laughs> gets it wrong? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's always a, a glorious question. And the reality is they're going to be used by doctors and institutions and so on and so forth. So the duty of care and the, the general sort of principle about negligence and, uh, and, and how that arises is that you would say there's a duty of care by the people who are treating you. So that would be the hospitals and the doctors using the AI. Obviously, you can't sue the machine, although you might be able to sue the, uh, the manufacturers or the, the software developers uh, for a particular AI if they do get it wrong. But just in terms of accuracy, and the medical profession themselves have recognized it. It's much quicker that AI can recognize from sort of scans and so on and so forth, patterns of, um, uh, of behavior, patterns of likely disease and so on and so forth, and be an incredibly powerful tool on that sort of basis. But the basic responsibility for using that tool will still rest with the medical institution and the doctor who, the human doctor who treats you. Uh, regardless of how grumpy they happen to be at any, on any given day. <laughs> well, hopefully we can make them less grumpy because um, <laughs> they will have a better tool. It will make everything far more efficient. And as I say, I work with lots of medical professionals as well as other people uh, around the world talking about institutions and how we can embrace the fantastic opportunities offered, offered by technology to make people's lives a lot easier, uh, to make their stress levels far less um, and basically reduce their workload accordingly. Oh, that sounds marvellous. Thanks very much, Andrew. Andrew Eborn, barrister, broadcaster and futurist. Andrew Eborn.